Hello. Thanks, Jackie. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining for Hashi Talks. Uh, the schedule looks great. I'm sad I can't see most of these talks, but I will catch some of them later. Uh, so I'm happy to be here uh, during this these trying times of YouTube Live not being available. Uh, but in being here, I get to introduce the next speaker. And so that is what I'm going to do. The next speaker is Pedro Nimrizi. Uh, he's going to be giving a talk titled Terraform Infrastructure as Code and the Robot Dog, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. I'm going to stick around and watch this one because I love strange Terraform. Uh, I shouldn't say strange, different Terraform use cases. Uh, they're very exciting to me. Uh, Pedram is the Director of Intelligent Software at the Machine Perceptive Cognitive Robotics Lab, an AI blockchain advisor, highly skilled in cybernetic scalability, and Kung Fu. Uh, really threw that last one in there. So uh, welcome, Pedro. So I am in my garage, which is kind of messy, but uh, I will give you a quick show of Astro. He's sitting here right now with me. What, what is that you just showed us? Well, that was Astro. Um, and I'll set the camera up in front of him. Can you guys see that? Ah, uh, yes. So Astro is a quadruped robot dog. He's uh, from a company called Ghost Robotics, and he primarily is used for military reconnaissance. Um, we decided to make him a little bit friendlier for civilian use. Um, my background is actually as a chief technology officer of a social network. Um, I've been following HashiCorp since before it existed. Uh, I remember uh, following Mitchell and uh, his partner's work in REAC. And uh, for those who don't know, REAC is a, was a distributed uh, database that was designed in Erlang specifically for fault tolerance. And one of the areas that I'm very interested in the use of computer systems is how do we maintain complexity? And one of those uh, important aspects to understand about system complexity is it's really represented in something called uh, variety, right? So if you think of uh, a one digit display as 10 system states, by adding one more digit to the display, your number of system states has just jumped to 100. So the, the concept there is, is really understanding that every one little thing that you add to a system, even if you've done through DevOps, even if you've done it in isolation and in a, a vacuumed environment, once you start to introduce all these components together, they start to play off of each other. So I've been using a lot of these tools in my work for distributed systems and social networks. It's, uh, as anyone can imagine, most of this stuff happens on AWS. And you know, once you start going into multiple clusters of servers, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to organize. So one of the things that we do often is we use Packer to create a new AMI. But then in a distributed system, we want to know what specifically needs to change, and we don't want to touch anything else. And in that regard, Terraform is extremely useful. And the Vault, Packer, and Vagrant are almost things that are integral, mainly because I wouldn't deploy anything with Terraform unless it was generated through um, some kind of uh, Packer or Vagrant interaction. And then I have to make sure that I don't commit all of the secret codes into Git, and that's what I use Vault for. So uh, MPCR Lab is a laboratory that is in Florida Atlantic University. And it's a very interesting uh, lab because it sits between engineering and science, uh, or rather engineering and computer science, and it sits in the behavioral sciences department. Um, being that uh, behavioral scientists are not usually associated with artificial intelligence, 
there's been a lot of uh, a lot of cool things to learn about it specifically um, you know how the sensors in our body uh, work how we have certain sensors that operate faster than others and nobody usually makes the connection between kung fu and robotics but in reality, uh, they're very related in cybernetics because cybernetics was the concept of taking everything that was possible through the central nervous system of animals and applying that to machines. Everything that man and animals had, or humans and animals had, were studied for the benefit of being able to bring that adaptivity uh, and failure tolerance and the ability to um, recover to machines. So, uh, in the sense of, of Kung Fu, we actually learn not to use our eyes because our eyes operate at a very slow frame rate compared to our sense of touch. And it's just coincidental that uh, this particular type of robot is, is able to feel the world with pressure sensors in his feet and the ability to uh, gauge different points of, of movement. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, robot operating system in conjunction with Terraform, as this isn't something that most people have actually heard of. And robot operating system was uh, something that came out of Stanford. It's been around for over 10 years. Um, in, you know, a couple of years, it should be used in over half of the robots in the world. So some of the things that I really have been working on to uh, and advance the state in uh, this industry is really incorporating a lot of the, the changes that have happened in connected systems in the cloud. I worked with Rackspace over eight years ago <clears throat> and we deployed one of the first hybrid uh, systems where Half of it was in cloud systems, half of it was in dedicated, and, it, and it, we used some networking infrastructure in between the two. And I feel like that's kind of where we're at right now with the robotics, where you kind of need both sides of it. And I don't see that going away very, very much because you can't really guarantee that you're going to have the connectivity. So you have to have a way for the system to be able to understand what information is uh, noisy and should be disregarded and what information is not. And this is, this is determined mathematically um, with something uh, usually called a Kalman filter or an extended Kalman filter, depending on whether or not you're working with drones that fly around or dogs that crawl around or uh, anywhere in between. So uh, in <clears throat> computer vision and robot operating systems, the, the systems in uh, ROS are composed of networks and those are basically topics. The topics are connected to sensors and the sensors are connected to actuators. So you can imagine uh, that a, uh, uh, an actuator would be listening for messages. And then when we are doing uh, computer vision, we're essentially uh, mimicking certain aspects of the visual cortex to be able to create a, a way of recognizing uh, things that we want to be recognized by presenting uh, pixel images uh, to a GPU system. So uh, for those uh, who aren't familiar, a GPU is initially mainly for gaming. Uh, gaming back in the day had something called shaders, which required hundreds and hundreds of cores to be able to make uh, the frame rate for the, from a regular CPU to uh, be decent. Uh, nowadays, GPUs have over 11 gigabytes of DDR4 memory and thousands of processors. Um, coincidentally, uh, some of these computers, if you were to try to uh, purchase them in the 90s, they would have been billions of dollars and they wouldn't have had the internet. So the components that make up robotic systems, like I was saying, the more components you have, the higher the chances of the software conflicting, the complexity increases, the number of simultaneous system states extends towards infinity. And this is 
one of the reasons why DevOps is so important is that it reduces the number of system states. So if you have many developers trying to uh, work on something together, or in my case, uh, junior programmers who may be interested in getting into artificial intelligence, but they're um, you know, at the teenage level, <clears throat> and there could be a lot of uh, back and forth with people who may only be there for a short amount of time, or people who are gonna be there for longer, Making it so everybody is simpatico and not stepping on each other's toes is, is one of the reasons uh, I think DevOps is so popular and it's one of the ways to reduce those uh, chances for complexity to creep in. So when we uh, talk about AI and robotics, really what we're talking about is creating models. And a model is just, you know, it's kind of like a map. And it's, it's good to understand that a model and a map is never really 100% accurate. Um, it's, you know, a good way of describing this, uh, I would say is uh, picture yourself in a room and now draw the room as you see it. And then you would ask, did you draw yourself in the room? Which is fine, you can make, you can correct that and then redraw it and this time draw yourself in the room. But did you draw yourself, drawing yourself in the room and as you can see a map or a model could reach uh, recursions that you know make it impossible to actually fully factor everything in so one of the things that i work with is simulators and um, there are many different ways of implementing them there's uh, they're generally done in gaming engines microsoft has uh, a something called air sim which sits on top of unity or unreal and there are other various uh, things is, that do that as well one of the things that i do which is very kind of a devops approach is creating a simulated environment where the robot is essentially allowed to jump onto i don't know if i have this open here, but if i do i can pop The uh, simulator allows me to jump into uh, a virtual world and be able to test out these things. It's essentially a unit test um, where not only do I have to mock the data sources, but actually I have to mock reality as well. So some of these uh, uh, behavioral science aspects uh, appear, like here I'm teaching in Astro to say uh, yes or no. And we kind of say yes and no all the time, but we don't always do it verbally. So how can we uh, incorporate uh, different uh, modalities to be able to increase communication? If you weren't able to speak, what would you do? And then we have the ability to create uh, layers of heuristics to, to say, which is the better medium to use right now? Which one is more limited? So if you kind of see through Astro's eyes, he really is a fusion of, of a bunch of different sensors um, by creating a uh, left and right image. Uh, we create a disparity map and with that disparity map, we uh, are essentially able to analyze depth, very similar to how human eyes are, uh, are able to do that. Uh, additionally, um, You'll, we use uh, time of flight sensors. And what's, what's important about that is that, you know, we really understand the failure modes of every sensor and we combine them in a way that there are no, you know, very large failure modes that are, that are unable to be addressed. So the time of flight sensors are important because they're not dependent on uh, lumosity. So if uh, there really isn't any light, um, you still need to be able to get an idea of what does the terrain look like and what do I need to, uh, to not trip over? So uh, here's uh, Astro learning uh, some stuff at the Kung Fu School. Uh, and I like to uh, 
imagine where a cybernetic system such as this could keep you or your children safe. Um, Florida has, <clears throat> well, Florida has no excuse. If you Google Florida man, then you'll understand what I mean. But uh, we had a, uh, a shooting in a high school where 20, uh, 20 children were killed. Um, the thing that bothered me the most is that there were armed police officers that refused to go in. And you can't really blame anybody for not wanting to take on a semi-automatic rifle. However, I, I think that uh, we're at the point in time where if a situation like that happens, um, then you know a, a robot made out of airplane grade aluminum that knows some of the principles of defensive tactics would be very, very useful. And again, we, uh, we take this multimodality and we, we basically process it. And that can come in any, in any variation. So um, usually we call them, we, uh, we look at them by dimension. So in an image, we would have a two-dimensional dimension. In video, we would have a three-dimensional dimension, but not because of depth, but because of space time. Uh, speech and audio usually drop to single dimensions and laser scan um, and time series data as well. So one of the, uh, the big issues with robotics is that you kind of have this chicken and egg problem where you need to create a map of the world for them to localize themselves, which is kind of hard because you don't need a map to know where you are in the kitchen. Uh, maybe if the kitchen was the, was the size of, you know, a, a small house, but if you want to go somewhere, you kind of already have mapped the area. Robots don't really have this benefit and the state of the art, rather the bleeding edge is in something called frontier um, analysis, where those two things are done at the same time. But essentially, once we have some nearby measurements, we need to estimate you know, the position and orientation of the robot. And one of the things that's very interesting is augmented reality and virtual reality shares this exact same problem. So when we want to do something like spatially map an environment um, to be able to move around the terrain, we also need to do that in something uh, that needs to factor in the environment. So if you look at Magic Leap, which is also a company in Florida, um, they have the spatial mapping uh, built into the headset. So, you know, when something bounces off the wall or hits the ceiling, it actually uh, looks like it did that because it's aware of where that is. Where that is. So in cognitive more robotics is a little bit more towards where I'd like to see the industry go. And um, it's almost getting there. I, I don't know if we're anywhere near uh, a data from Star Trek, but we're definitely at the point where we are doing soft robotics and uh, these present a lot of their own technical challenges. The specific um, genre, I guess, uh, of science would be called morphological intelligence. And those are, that's one of the aspects that, that's actually very useful in, um, in Kung Fu as well. So the main thing that relates how Terraform and Ross work together is that we essentially create a graph. Um, the graph of your infrastructure allows you to make very uh, discrete changes with the confidence of knowing you're not gonna blow everything up. Um, the uh, same is true with when we're working on uh, the robotic system. So the robotic systems are going to be very concerned that if we have uh, components of the system where, uh, you know, we're not able to uh, to know what's going to happen, then we need a lot of sanity checks. And those sanity checks will, will basically be determined by whether or not there are missing edges in our graph. And it's a very uh, unique diagnostic tool, but once you have it, you, you know, nobody's going to pry it away from you because it makes different approaches just seem very archaic. So uh, neural networks learn by experience, and we uh, are full of very odd experiences that kind of shape and define us. So I, uh, 
Um, I've created a platform for Astro to walk around the neighborhood, and he's being uh, driven by a, uh, let's say, it's called a, a low CDD XL1. They're surprisingly powerful. That little toy car will pull the dog and probably Mitchell. <laughs> and here he is sitting in the back of my uh, car. So that would kind of be funny if you popped the trunk and a little robot popped out. But um, as you can see, this mess of wires and computers and stuff together is, is very problematic to be able to, uh, to, to fully grok and specifically work in a team. So uh, this new approach to applying graphs end to end from the data infrastructure down to uh, the software infrastructure down to the internal uh, schematics of, uh, well, not just the internal schematics on the electrical level, but in the, in the middle where these things are connected to each other by software. And then you have the, you know, the concerns of has this software been utilized in a way that factors in what are the frame rates, refresh rates, sensitivity rates of each individual device. So our brains do that very well. Uh, and the example that I like to give uh, usually is that when you have a, a, anything spinning, you, you don't see any, any more than what, you, what your frame rate of your eyes are operating at, which is about 0 0.4. So what your brain does is it creates an abstraction. And that's an important uh, thing to consider because you know, there's an operating mode where that abstraction is possible. And if you're going beyond it, then it won't be possible. Um, so Astro has uh, been in a, the news. Um, he's, he was at a, a gala doing a robot dance off. Um, I don't know if this will load if I click it. know how we're doing on time. Astro. A team of professors at FAU say the work they're doing is the first of its kind in the world. CBS Sports' Carly Barnett shows us Astro in action. It looks like something out of the movie, but this is a reality. Meet Astro. He's the brain pup of a team of experts at Florida Atlantic University. In fields like math, software, engineering, and psychology. A handful of other four-legged robots exist like this around the globe, but Astro is a different breed. So in terms of having the head and the eyes and the ears and the AI brain that we're building, this is the only unit in the world like this one. He is the first to have a head complete with a computerized brain. So unlike a typical robot program to do a repetitive task, Astro will be trained and essentially learn to respond to images and situations. A newborn baby has to learn a language and learn how to speak. And even learn how to read your emotions, Astro has to learn that. So this new kind of artificial intelligence depends on a simulation of the brain that's actually living inside of Astro. Made of airplane grade aluminum and 3D printing, the 100 pound robo dog contains six different computers and other features. So he actually has a bunch of cameras, one on his nose, two right here, and then he's actually got millimeter weighted imaging, which is sort of like a radar, so it can see through doors. Astro is the result of about nine months of work so far. Right now, he can look around, walk, and talk. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. And Astro can even respond to voice commands. Astro stand. So I've been able to see in here, he's gonna have gas sensors that are gonna be able to detect things that are in the environment. He might be able to smell whether they're explosive. He also may be able to tell whether somebody uh, it has some sort of medical condition. As far as his current capabilities, Astro is still very much a puppy, but they are excited by the potential. Uh, what FAU started, 
will hopefully spread. And if it does, then we'll see stuff like this becoming very normal. Astro Lay, Carly Barnett, CBS 4 News. And here we have them uh, walking around with some kids. This is at a high school, uh, a high school uh, science uh, fair. It's a middle school. Hi, I'm William Hunt. We're the machine perception and cognitive robotics laboratory. And we built deep learning brains to be hardware. Edge devices like this, with the RC car hack we have here, or even Astro, our robotic dog. A magically pet set we're just good so then the question really comes down to you know what will this look like in a few years um and i think we're 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 at a point of, of a great convergence where systems that we connect with you know need to be reliable before they really need to be reliable because people hated downtime now they need to be reliable because people's lives are on um, and systems that are, have expectations that are outside reality would be a very dangerous situation. Uh, primarily, you know, wanting to uh, kind of create this benign AI that's able to assist us in our day to day um, is something that I think uh, is very, very important. And the more tools that we have at our disposal to be able to integrate um, these systems, the better. Um, the last thing that, um, I know this is a little fuzzy, but the last thing that we're working on is integrating something called Mavlink. Um, and this would basically create a shared environment. So it doesn't matter if you're working on a drone or if you're working on a, a self-driving car, you'd be able to utilize some of the same tools. And we're working on creating these DevOps packages around uh, robot operating system, integrating uh, some of the best from Terraform. And, Here's something cute to end on. The puppy likes him. Thank you. you that was great.